Hello, beautiful Sunnyside Up community. We are on today with the gorgeous Megan Venable, who is also local to Michigan. So we are on video today and audio sharing her amazing, incredible story that I'm really excited to hear all the details of. Um, Megan Venable was introduced to me from a mutual friend, and her bio is simply this. She is a faith-filled mama, single mom, uh, author, and she has been in the wellness and fitness space for over 17 years. And she's going to share with us today her heart, her journey, everything that she's been to leading up to this point. And we're just so grateful you're here, Megan. Thank you for being on the Sunny Side Up community with us. Yes, thank you for having me. It's such an honor. Great. Good. We're so glad you're here. So let's just jump right in. Um, where did you grow up? I grew up in Ferndale. Okay. Ferndale, yep. Michigan. Okay. Yep. And your business is where? I uh, work in Rochester Hills, Michigan. In Rochester Hills. Okay. And you were starting to tell me before we hit record, um, do you own Stretch Zone? No, I'm, I run Stretch Zone. So I'm the general manager at the one in Rochester Hills. Okay. How has Stretch Zone been an important part of your life? What do you do there? So basically everyone that comes to a consultation, they meet with me. So my primary responsibility is to take people through their initial stretch, their initial initial assessment, and then sell them a program basically. So for me, it's been a transition from, you know, I was a personal trainer for 15 years. So it's a little bit like just with the natural progression of age, less beating the crap out of people, less beating the crap out of myself and more like recovery and getting into that space. Right. Which is super important as we age, um, because I can think of myself in my twenties, right? In my twenties, I was like, um, you know, kickboxing and running and like beating the crap out of my body and you're right like as we age it's super important that we're focused on mobility and stretching and listening to our body and and those kinds of things right yes absolutely yeah so um you're obviously very passionate about fitness and wellness um kind of the bread and butter I want to dive in with you today is an aspect of that wellness because obviously um, Sunny Side Up is about finding that sunshine through all the storms we go through in life. Um, so I just want to jump right in and talk about, I'm so excited for you that you're an author, that you yes. just published a book. When was that? July? Yes, it was July 17th. It, it came out on Amazon. Oh my gosh. Okay. So tell us all about that. How did that happen? What did that look like? What's the book about? Just jump right in on the book. Yeah. So originally I read my great uncle's autobiography and he never published it. There was just a couple of copies floating through the family and I read it and I thought, oh my gosh, what a great way to leave a legacy. So when I was reading, it was like almost a hundred years ago. So I got to deep dive into what his life was like. And, you know, in a hundred years, no one's going to know who I am, but I thought that this would be a great way to tell future generations, um, like what I went through and especially like with my struggle with alcohol, like a lot of it is genetic based. So I thought maybe my great, great, great granddaughter will read this book one day. So originally it started as just something to pass along, like a legacy, something to leave behind. And the deeper I got into it, I was, I was inspired and called, you know, by God, like put this out there. There's a lot of people that could relate to this. There's a lot of people this could help heal. So I kind of took it to the next level of publishing it at that point. Okay. So what is the book called? The book is called Perfect Illusion. Okay. Okay. Perfect Illusion, and why is that the title? So with my alcoholism, it was, I was a complete oxymoron. So I was a personal trainer. I was super fit, took very good care of myself. But then there was this other aspect that I was hiding from the world that I was drinking until I was blacking out. I was making horrible decisions. I was putting myself in dangerous situations. So, um... To me, 
perfect illusion is like, that is what I was creating. I was trying to create is this perfect illusion that I have it all together. Everything's fine. As long as everything was fine on the outside, my body looked good, my hair looked good, my skin, my nails, my house, my bills were paid. Like I could avoid what was actually going on. So in my mind, I created my own perfect illusion. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And I think a lot of people out there listening to this either have a loved one that's struggling with that, have a loved one that currently or in the past has struggled with that, or they themselves are walking through that perfect delusion. So how long have you been sober? I have been sober. I just hit eight months. This eight time months. Around. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Thank that's you. Amazing. Yeah. So how long did it take you to write the book? It took me, I started January 1st of 2024. Okay. So I had originally bought a book that said how to write a novel in 90 days. Okay. And so it took me less than 90 days. But honestly, Allie, I had been writing that book in my head for probably a decade. You know what I mean? Sure. sure. That's really impressive. Um, I thought you were going to tell me like 2021, I sat down with pen and paper, but you're like, nope, January. So it's only been seven months. I mean, that's right. That's yeah. really impressive. Um, okay, so this is also really cool, Megan, that you've been sober for eight months and you published a book within eight months. So you've been sober through the whole writing process and the publishing process. So this book that we are going to read that I'm encouraging all of us to read, um, again, the name is Perfect Illusion and you can get the book on Amazon by Megan Venable. Um, when we read it, we can keep that in mind that you have struggled with alcoholism and this idea that you had to live this perfect existence all the while you're suffering. Um, now you're walking through that next chapter of your life. Um, so when you say, I want to back up a little bit, when you say writing a book will be a good legacy and talking about how you're genetically predisposed to alcoholism. What do you mean by that? Like, do you have a long history in your family of alcoholism? How do you know that you're genetically wired to be that way? Yeah. So my dad struggled with alcoholism. Um, I'm from a big Irish family, a lot of drinkers. I'm one of five children. And I would say, you know, in AA, they teach you, you are not supposed to label anyone as an alcoholic. But I would say out of the three of us, five children, um, we drink where there's no shutoff valve. Okay, so you're saying then um, what you recognize is that coming from an Irish family with a dad kind of just down the long line of generations in your family or within your own family, you recognize a pattern that you pick up a drink and you can't stop. That's, that's a common theme. Yeah. And I mean, it was something that I recognized fairly early. So the very first time I ever got drunk, I was at a frat party. I was 19 years old and we were playing beer pong and I remember thinking this is the greatest feeling in the world and I never want it to end and from that moment and like I just always have been chasing that right so I knew the moment that I started drinking something was different with me okay okay I was gonna ask you that question why? Why do you why do you chase the feeling of drinking? So it sounds like when you were in that space as a 19-year-old, it felt really euphoric. It felt really good. But was there something in your life that was too dark to deal with? Um I would say no. Like I had a great childhood. My parents are married. I went to a Catholic school you know, nothing that traumatic, 
I'm sure there's subconscious layers, but I just always was wearing like a coat of self-consciousness and self-doubt. And when I drank, it just literally fell off. And I felt like I could be the person I was supposed to be without this like heavy coat of like, what are people thinking? And like this self-consciousness that was weighing me down. Okay. So drinking for you is, is, was, was to mask your insecurities. It was a way for you to walk through the insecurities and the things you felt about yourself that it kind of made you feel invincible, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So this, this last time of getting sober, what does that look like? How, how would you inspire someone listening to this or encourage someone listening to this to take that first step of sobriety? Um, I would say, you know, I don't like to use tough love because that never really worked with me. I would say first and foremost, give yourself some compassion, some grace, stop beating the crap out of yourself. Like shame and guilt are not going to work. They're not going to get you where you need to be. But I would say taking the first step is all about, it's a skill, right? Practice. So I'm not like, go to AA, go to 90 meetings in 90 days, get a sponsor, work the 12 steps. Boom. Great. Your life is perfect. Maybe just practice, you know? So if you're drinking heavily five nights a week, maybe just practice one night, not drinking. And then that gives you the space to actually feel your feelings and find activities that you enjoy that don't involve drinking. So that's the, that's what I would say. Just practice, just practice, start somewhere because the solution oftentimes and society is like absence for someone that drinks, like I drink, the solution is absence. But also when I think about like, oh, I can never have a drink again for the rest of my life. It's way too big of a concept. Hmm. It's, it's, it's way too much. So maybe just start with just practicing. Megan, that's really interesting because when I think of alcoholism and drug addiction and any kind of addiction, when you say it's way too much to think I can never have a drink ever again in my life, I think, well, cold turkey is best. Choosing to never have a drink again in your life is going to save your life. Choosing to never have a drink again in your life is going to propel you into these positive steps. But what I love about what you said is that when you tell the brain and the mind, I guess just like AA says, one day at a time, one step at a time, and not overwhelm yourself to say, you know, this doesn't have to be forever, even though probably subconsciously, you know, and you hope it's forever. Yeah. Or do you not feel that way? No, absolutely. I feel that way. Um, It was just at the time when I would think about that, it was too big of a concept. Yeah. So I guess for me, my story, you know, I got sober the first time around for a year when I was 20. I got sober again when I was 30 for 15 months. I guess don't let failure like set you back. Like the more you fail, the closer you're getting to getting sober. So like, it doesn't have to be perfect the first time around. No, I think that's really good advice for a lot of things. Um, I guess in my walk of life, I feel like we all have self, self-defeating self habits. We all have addictions of some sort, right? So um, food, sex, drugs, alcohol, um, negative self-talk, self-harm, uh, repeating negative habits over and over again. Um, and eventually, in order to heal, we have to, like you said, um, come to the place where we want to do better for ourselves. Back up. Um, we started talking about legacy and genetics. And um, what kind of legacy 
do you think, or do you feel like writing this book, like you have a daughter and I want to talk about that. So what kind of legacy do you hope this book will leave? Um, I want to leave the legacy that like, you don't have to be perfect. You don't, you know, strength comes in many forms and I struggled with perfectionism for so long. And if you read my book, I mean, there's some pretty raw details in it that shows that I was absolutely not perfect, but it doesn't mean you're not good. So like an underlying thought with me, and I just, you know, recently discovered this was like, I thought I was bad. I thought I was bad because, you know, when I drank, I did bad things. So I really had to unlearn that and reprogram reprogram myself. Like, no, I am good. And um, because we all make mistakes, right? We all do things that we're not proud of, that we're ashamed of, that we're embarrassed by. It doesn't take away the essence of you being good. So the more I was stuck in that trap, that cycle of I'm bad, I'm bad. And it wasn't like I was thinking it, it was just layered so deep down. The more I was putting myself in situations to make that true, because it's the story I was telling myself. So like you were talking about like negative self-talk, especially I think women struggle with that. So if, you know, my great, great, great granddaughter reads it, I want her to know she's good. She's from God and kind of go from there. I love that so much. Um, And I love that you knew right away that that message I want I want to say it's such a simple message but it's complicated at the same time because you're right as women we are wired to be so hard on ourselves and think we have to be perfect Mm -hmm. um so I think that that's really powerful and important um and I definitely can't wait to read your book um I wish I would have read it before this interview but we kind of did this quickly it kind of like came up on me quickly so I do plan to read your book and I would love again to encourage everybody listening to this um to read your book so um I would venture to guess that when we talk about a bright spot in your life and a sunshine in the storms, it's your daughter. Um, so talk to us, tell us about um, the blessing of her coming into your life and what motherhood looked like for you. Yeah. So I got pregnant when I was 19, unmarried, being from a Catholic family. So it was a very shameful thing. And um, I actually was encouraged by my parents to put Christina up for adoption. And I was undecided my whole entire pregnancy. And I finally decided I, you know, her dad wasn't taking the steps that I needed him to take for fatherhood. And I thought she would be better with a family that was more financially together, you know, not 19 years old, could provide her the life that I could not provide for her. So I picked out adoptive parents. I met them and went into labor. And, you know, the adoptive parents came and they named her. They named her Caitlin. And I would say I was in the hospital for three days The second day, I was so torn up, you know, because her dad wanted me to keep her and I didn't, I didn't know what was best. I walked to the chapel, Christina was in the nursery and I just prayed to God, what should I do? What is your will? And I changed my mind and I kept her and I can honestly say it is the best decision I have ever made. I cannot imagine I mean, I think I drank a lot with her. I can't even imagine the amount I would have drank knowing that I had a child out there like that, that heartache. Um, so yeah, absolutely best decision I ever made. 
So does she live local? Yeah, she lives with me. She lives with you, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Yeah. gotcha. Um, I couldn't do the math. I didn't know if she was like out on her own or. Yeah, she's 19. She's 19. Okay, okay. Got it. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that. And I mean, gosh, how many people. Okay, first of all, to go back to think about having to wrestle with that decision of adoption or keeping her or being 19 yourself and and having to face that is, I can't even imagine the weight of that. Um, but obviously you are a woman of such strong faith and you gave it to God and you knew that his purpose was much higher and much bigger and much more profound than we can even wrap our heads around. Um, and I am in that same boat as you. Um, I would be lost without God. And I wanted to say to you earlier that he created you in his image. And, you know, when we stop and think about that, all of the shame and all of the self deprivating thoughts and all the ways that we beat ourselves up in life, I always go back to that, that if he created me, how could he possibly have, I mean, he doesn't create anything that's, um, that's not beautiful. That's not in his image. That's not righteous. It's not, um, that shouldn't accept grace, you know? Um, and, and that brings me back, you know? So, um, I share that with you and it's really, my faith is really important to me. Um, were there times in your journey of being a, um, a young mom and, and addiction and things like that, where you, you wrestled with your faith? I would say yes, absolutely. Yeah. There was times, I would say probably my 20s, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was really upset with God. I was really angry with God. I felt like I had been dealt a really hard hand and things weren't, you know, going the way that I thought they should go. And I turned my back on God because it was like, I felt for so long, you know, I did everything I was supposed to do. And then, you know, it was just, it was a lot getting married so young, having her so long, so young, you know, I was in survival mode, a lot of raising her and I was blaming God. I was pissed off. You know, I was like, you know, I didn't get to have, you know, I didn't get a um, gender reveal. Like I didn't get a great, beautiful wedding. I didn't get this, you know, all these things that were happening around me, the whole, like comparing myself to others. And yeah, I was, I was truly, I was upset. I was blaming God. Well, and you brought up another very triggering word and comparison is the root of all heartache, right? Um, you know, I didn't have the family I wanted growing up or I didn't get the job I wanted or um, I would be the most amazing mom and I've got everything I need to provide for a child yet this woman down the road who can't even take care of one child is getting five, right? So we play this game with ourselves and we pretend we're in control. We try to be in control. And then we very quickly learn that that was never the case to begin with. And comparison really will rob you of joy. Um, I've learned that in so many facets of my life. And I also want to say, I think, you know, a really big lesson for me, and I want to ask you your thoughts on this are, I have really stepped into, and it's always been a part of me that women, especially women, we are not meant to be in competition. We are meant to be in collaboration. And anytime we come to a relationship or a circle or sisterhood or anything like that with that competitive spirit, um, you know, really doing ourselves a disservice. So what do the circle, the women that you are surrounded in look like? Or do you feel like you have a really good village in place? You know, getting sober, I, I have learned, I have two best friends, Nicole and Dana. Um, 
But I have learned for me personally, the smaller my circle, the better. So I am a pretty sensitive person. I'm an empath. Being around people, sometimes it's exhausting for me. So I am very picky with the people I choose to be with because time is very important to me. So I'm not just going to be out to be out. I would rather be home reading or, or doing something that's going to fill me up. Because sometimes for me personally, being with others is like a lot of giving of myself. So aside from my two best friends, I don't have like a huge circle, but that that's really all I need. You know, I have a sister and I have two sister-in-laws. I have tons of cousins. So I have a built-in friend circle with a huge family that I have. Well, I love that too, because you just brought up the point and you kind of reinforce the point that two or three people that are, um, that are there for you and filling your bucket and a part of your village, that's all you need. You know, that's all you need. And, um, as long as we have those people in our lives that we can lean on, um, I think that's really important because I also feel that loneliness and isolation, um, you know, we just came out of a really challenging time four years ago where we were all separated. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of people would have a story about navigating 2020, um, and turning to alcohol. My goodness. I mean, wouldn't you say how many people have you talked to that really struggled with that? Oh yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. It was just too convenient, right? Everyone's working at home. Yeah. You don't have to go to work. You know, it's just way too accessible. Right. Right. Yeah, no, for sure. So that village is important and I'm glad you have one and anyone out there listening that, you know, maybe you feel like I don't have that village or I don't have that circle. And, um, just know that you are never alone. And even like Megan and I would be happy to, to talk to you, to be a resource, to offer a listening ear. Um, you truly are never alone. And I think sometimes we get into such a shame cycle with ourselves. We think we can't come back to, from the things we've done. And I think Megan is a perfect example that you can, and that you can step through that storm. Yeah. So, um, all right. So I wanted to ask you, um, we talk on sunny side up podcast about navigating the storms and, and tools to get through them. Um, what are some tools, Megan, in your life, um, that, that have replaced those negative things that you've walked through? Is it breath work? I know we talked about exercise and stretching, but breath work, walking, travel, um, changing your diet, replacing, you know, negative habits with positive habits. Let's talk a little bit about what some of those things are for you um, that could maybe help somebody else. Yeah, 100%. So I feel like in a lot of uh, books that like self-help books that I read or podcasts, I would always hear like the solution is love yourself and believe in yourself. And it's like, yeah, no shit. How do you do that? Like, what does that look like? And I agree. Once you do love yourself and believe in yourself, things do naturally fall into place. But I didn't know how to do that. You know, you don't go to school. It's not a class that's taught. I mean, even my mom, like, that was not really what she was teaching me, like how to love yourself, how to believe in yourself. I was more taught, like, be nice, be quiet, stay out of the way kind of a thing. So some of the tools would be like, I have to make sure I have time for myself. Every single morning I wake up, I make my coffee, I have my Bible, my journal, you know, I write down my affirmations, I write down my goals, I write down my prayer list, and I just sit and spend some time with God and just practice being in the moment. And I think that loving yourself is a skill, right? Like love is an action. When you love your husband or you love your child, you have to actively work at it. So loving yourself is like something that I've had to work at. Um, walking outside in nature has been really helpful for me. Just practicing 
being in the moment and not chasing the next thing has been extremely helpful. Mm, amen. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm somebody that lives in the busy. So I was jotting down a note when you were saying that because, um, gosh, if I could do that every morning, be in the moment and start my day with God and affirmations, I know the days that I do that, I feel so much better. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's those, again, I'm using the word simple, but it's not always simple. Um, those, those simple things in the morning that set the tone for your day. Yeah. Um, 100%. Yeah. So Megan, what lights you up? What just makes you like, you think about it and it brings you joy. Um, I like doing hard things. I like chasing and pursuing hard things. Um, so I like doing things that most people can't, you know, running a half marathon, doing 10 pull-ups, writing a book. That is really what gets me going. If I can say, I'm going to do something, have the discipline to actively work on it, finish the project. That's, that's like my new high. I love that. You are definitely a go-getter. I am gathering that. Um, okay. So how do you write a book? You said you read a book to write a book. What would you, how would you encourage somebody listening to this? If they were like, I want to write a book and share my story. What, what do they do? Yeah. So the book that I got was extremely helpful because you read a chapter and it told you what to write. Now, granted, it was how to write a novel and mine is a memoir. So I adjusted a little, a little bit, but it's a, it was a protocol, right? It was every single day without fail, you write for two hours, no matter what. And it would be one day is like scene development. The next day is like, write a list of six characters that are going to be in your book and then details about them. And then write the transitions, like the beginning, the middle, the end, write the conflict, write the resolution. So that protocol was extremely helpful for me because otherwise I was writing about my whole life. I was just, you know, without that guide, it was like, uh, where do I start? What I am gathering from this chat with you is you thrive on structure. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gathering that. Um, I think most of us do, but I love that you honor the structure. Yes, which is crazy because it's such a part of me. But when I was drinking, it was so chaotic. You know, those like those differences, right? Like I could be so structured and so disciplined and then like a complete mess when I was drinking. I think you even use the word oxymoron because it is an oxymoron. Like 100%. It's, it's a cycle, right? You thrive on structure. You need all those things, but then you drink and it just takes it all away. It, you're not your true self. You're not your true who you're meant to be. Right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So what's next? So I am working on being okay with where I am. So um, I think chasing goals is a great thing. But for so many years, it was like, oh, I'll be happy when I have the right boyfriend. I'll be happy when I'm married. I'll be happy when my kid stops misbehaving and getting suspended from school. I'll be happy when I have a bigger house. And so now it's more like, yes, I can still have goals, but like, I can't put my happiness on hold until I accomplish every single thing that I want to accomplish. Does that make sense? It completely makes sense. And I wrote down the words, I'll be happy when, you know, how many of us say, I'll be happy when I lose 10 pounds. I'll be happy when, like you were saying, I'll be happy when I find the love of my life. I'll be happy when, um, whatever it is, fill in the blank. And Anybody listening to this right now, raise your hand if you're still doing that. You know, we can decide right now 
that we can just be happy in this moment. And like you said earlier, I don't necessarily know how the heck to do that. How do I do that? But I think one thing that we can do is just say, ask ourselves, how can I be happy in this moment? And where can I find gratitude? Because gratitude is huge. Um, I know whenever I'm veering off the path of happiness, um, I have to get back to my gratitude. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, if I look at, it's like when in the mornings and I'm like, um, I have, I want to make a hundred grand a year and I want to do this and I want to do this. And it's like, okay, how about the fact that you used to write every single day? I want to make 50 grand a year. And now you are like, take a moment to appreciate that piece. Right. A hundred percent. Look at how far you've come. And that's the power of writing too. That's the power of vision boarding. That's the power of having a journal because you can see how far you've come. And you're also energetically putting it out to God, to the universe, to your, your higher power, that that is the direction that you want to go. Um, I'm a huge energy person and I'm also an empath. Um, and I've had to learn in my life how to create boundaries. Boundaries was my word for two years. <laughs> um, but yeah, I truly believe that. And I think the energy that we put out and where we give our energy is so, 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 so important. For sure. Um, this is kind of um, circling back to something we were talking about before, Megan, but have you heard of the book Dirty Genes or anything with like epigenetics or reversing genetics? No, but it sounds fascinating. Okay. Well, it, I wrote it down to bring up because I just picked up the book. It's called Dirty Genes, and I can't even tell you offhand who it's by. Um, I wish that I could, but look up the book, Dirty Jeans okay. and the book, Dirty Jeans talks about, um, how we live in a world that says, okay, uh, well, your parents had heart disease and your parents had diabetes. So that's going to be a part of your, your health, uh, journey here, you know, like almost like we're predestined to have these physical ailments because our parents did or our grandparents did. Um, but the same is true with addiction and the same is true with mental health. And the premise of this book, Dirty Genes, is that we don't have to be sentenced to these genetic um, factors. And he talks about, the author talks about how to become aware of what your genetic factors are and then how to undo them, essentially. Um, where my knowledge base lies with this is I did the 23andMe genetic testing um, because I wanted to see where my ancestors were from, but also to plug in the genetic data um, and see which of my chromosomes are mutated. And then based on which of my chromosomes are mutated, I could identify where my genetic... Um, mutations were and how I could supplement. So why I'm bringing this up is because um, if you, Megan, are genetically predisposed to addiction and you don't have a shut off bell for alcohol, is there a possibility that if you did a genetic test, you are deficient in vitamin B, vitamin D, you don't naturally produce dopamine, you don't naturally produce serotonin. And so because of that, you're going to have to work your whole life to do things to increase those happy hormones in your body and supplement minerals where you may be lacking. And if you did that, Megan, would that lead to an easier path of staying sober? Does that make sense? Yeah. Very yeah. interesting concept for sure. Isn't it? Yes, definitely. Yeah. So I'm just dipping my toe into um, the research on that. And, you know, anybody listening to this, if you guys want to reach out, um, you know, and message, message me or Megan or whatever, um, more on this concept of um, epigenetics 
and genes. I do think there's something there, especially with, um, with addiction and mental health. And there's a lot to uncover, a lot to unpack. Um, have you ever done any kind of, um, like 23 and me or anything like that? I did do a DNA test. I don't okay. believe it's 23 and me. Um, I didn't find it super beneficial. It was okay. kind of vague, you know, it yeah. was kind of like stuff I already knew, but I don't think it was the 23 and me. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You and I can talk offline if you want, but, um, I kind of unlocked, um, how to take your genetic data and download the raw data and plug it in. It's called geneticgenie.com. And that's where you plug it in. I am a naturopath nerd. <laughs> like I love uncovering and diving into ways to heal the body, um, which is why I'm in school to become a naturopath. So um, I just wanted to bring that up because Megan, your story is so inspiring. And I think so many people listening to this are going to have so many questions about what would my path to sobriety look like? How could I heal myself? How could I heal my body? How could I heal my family? Um, and if we could just bring one sliver of hope, um, then I think we're headed in the right direction, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if you were to close your eyes and put your hand on your heart, and think about one message that you would want to deliver to the air, airways, one thing that you would want to say, and it doesn't have to do anything with anything we've talked about, what would that thing be? Um, try your best to take care of yourself. Taking care of yourself can be a full-time job between like you're talking about supplements and nutrients and eating the right thing and drinking enough water and meditating and cardiovascular work and weight training and yoga and getting enough sleep and keeping your stress down. I would say it's far more important to make that a priority than getting the new designer bag or the new car or the new upgrade on the phone. I think taking care of yourself, especially as women, mothers, it oftentimes gets put on the back burner, but it is essential. It's crucial. It's it's a job. We have to make it a priority. We have to take care of ourselves. I can think of so many women that need to hear that message. <laughs> Thank you. So how do you start doing that? Because I think that's so, so true. But how do we start? Is it penciling in a bubble bath? Is it um, signing up for a Pilates class? Like, how do we even start that process? Yeah, I think for me, uh, the very first step, and you're, you're absolutely right, small things. For me, I had to accept that taking care of myself was going to sometimes make other people unhappy. And I had to come to terms with that, you know, writing this book for heaven's sakes, I told my parents don't read it. You know, it, it may make them unhappy, but it was on my to-do list for life. Like at the, on my deathbed, I want to, to, to say I wrote a book and I published a book. So the very first step for me was to accept that, taking care of myself may ruffle some feathers. And once I accepted that, just like you're saying, small things, right? Take a bubble bath, do some Pilates, you know, make sure you are getting enough sleep. Um, sorry, so, 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 so important. I, I could not agree more. And I think it's a message that we all need to hear and then also encourage those other women in our lives. So um, how can people find you, Megan? How can they connect with you? So I am on Instagram. I have Megan Venable, Megan 
Oh, I should have looked this up. Megan period Venable, I think is my handle. Um, I'll and, put it in the comments too, but I think you're okay. right. Mm -hmm. And so that's like my, for everybody for the world Instagram, I have a different private one for family. And then I am also on Facebook and that is my maiden name, which is Megan Michelle. Um, so yeah, Facebook, Instagram would be a good way to reach out. Okay. And to buy your book, we mentioned this in the very beginning, but Perfect Illusion is available on Amazon, right? So search Perfect Illusion by Megan Venable on Amazon. And um, do you have any plans, Megan, to talk about your book? at like events or as a panelist or apply for a TED talk or like all those ambitious things or are you just feeling really good about just whoever wants to read the book can read it like where are you with that I would love nothing more than to speak at a panel and get the word out there I don't want to What's the word? I don't want to stress myself out about it too much because I have put it in God's hands. So mm -hmm. I met Christy on like pure accident and he, God really designed that. He brought her into my life and then she connected me with you. So yes, I definitely have those aspirations. However, I'm taking a little load off of my shoulders and giving it to God because he can direct it way better than I could anyways. So he already knows and it's already written. And I asked you that question on purpose because you and I both know the power of putting it out there. And so just by this episode alone and people listening to this, um, wherever this is supposed to lead for you, however big this is, uh, snowball effect, ripple effect, um, you know, ultimately God knows. But um, I could definitely foresee... I foresee the importance of women sitting in community talking about this book. Um, I foresee the importance of you sharing this story over and over again um, and just taking what you've created and all the beauty rising from the ashes. Um, it's a really big deal, Megan. Thank you. I appreciate really that. Thank deal. you. It really is. It really is um, far bigger than we can even imagine. So I have goosebumps. And anytime I have goosebumps, I know that that's God reaffirming. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So um, fun fact, I actually uh, made it a goal to write a book in 2020. And I started it. Um, I started it forever ago, but I kind of really, really sat down with it in 2020. And that's when the podcast started. So my, my book became a podcast essentially for now, but one day, one day I would love to write a book. Um, and then really quick, I want to mention you guys, Christy, who Megan mentioned, um, has been on the podcast. Christy Fiddler wrote a book, um, about, uh, she is the gal that you heard her story about getting a new heart and Christy and I's friendship goes way back. So, um, We've been in the presence of two incredible authors um, and very grateful for that. So I'm really glad you met Christy. She's phenomenal. Yes, she is so like, how are you this happy all the time? <laughs> is what I think when I meet her. I mean, so, ha so happy, so kind. It really blows my mind too to think about, you know, her struggles with her heart and how big her heart is and how golden her heart is. And then to have a new heart in her body, it's just, the whole thing just blows my mind. So, <laughs> yeah. oh my gosh. Wow. Wow. Well, I'm going to manifest. I'm going to uh, put it out there that the three of us will be together soon um, at a sunshine meetup or a TEDx talk or a book club or something. Um, I see that happening for sure. That would be awesome. You yeah. did hear that Christy is going to be on a TED talk, right? I did hear that. I did hear that. Yeah. So I'm for so those of you of guys her. listening, um, she is going to be at, is it Kalamazoo? I think uh, I'm not sure. 
Yeah, I think it's TEDx Kalamazoo. Um, I know TEDx Detroit is coming up um, this fall. So fall 2024, TEDx Detroit. Um, but yeah, we should look into that. Uh, yeah, Christy's going to make her debut for TEDx. So pretty cool. Yeah. Well, Megan, thank you so much for being on Sunny Side Up. Um, we're just so grateful you were here. Your story is so inspiring. Um, you guys go follow Megan on Instagram, on Facebook, Megan Venable, go buy her book, Perfect Illusion, and please reach out. Um, if you've been touched by Megan's story or you are struggling with addiction or um, anything in your life and, and you'd really love a listening ear, you can email me at bornsunnysideup at gmail.com or reach out on the podcast um, or Instagram, wherever that may be. So thank you again, Megan. Really grateful. Yes, it was my pleasure.